Support for Central Texas Gardener comes from HEB Texas Backyard, helping to beautify your backyard. From patio sets to Texas tough landscape plants, let HEB Texas Backyard help you get your garden started today. Central Texas Gardener, I'm Tom Spencer. Some of the most tolerant plants in our mood swing weather are the irises. When planted correctly and divided every few years, there are long lasting performers that make great pass alongs from one generation to the next. Today, Marnie Abel from the Iris Society of Austin explains how to grow them in your garden. On tour, we visit a makeover that restored an inner city lot. Just half a mile from downtown Austin, Wildlife of all kinds found Brianna Mariani and Mark Beekler's new address at the old home and garden they restored. When they united their separate households, they also teamed up as gardeners to turn a ramshackle yard into a neighborhood welcome mat. We knew we wanted to plant the whole front yard with very little turf grass. So, you know, we just kind of worked at it and we had dealt with a lot of really organic things and. Uh, you know, wandering paths and stuff, and it just didn't work in this small of a space, so we really went with a very formal, very structured, you know, shape to the yard, and then the plantings became much more loose and wonderful. In their new beds, Mark and Brianna recycled layers of newspapers covered by mulch to stifle weeds. Then they planted for a bit of privacy from the street, but open enough to encourage interaction with the neighbors. They sprinkled in understory texture and rotating perennial color. Mark built raised beds with well-drained soil for the cactus and succulents he brought from his old house. But Mark's design for the beds had another significance. It's important to have these little structural things, like even the, the boxwoods up there, it helps to give a foundation to things, because uh, things can get really kind of out of control and wild fast if you don't have those, those things there. Strips of grass also signify definition. I want a little bit of turf grass just to walk in, so we left the paths. Basically our paths are turf grass. And the, uh, the stone paths were here, and we're, our plan is to eventually take that out and put in grass with some pavers. Just have a little more grass, because it's pretty the, the stone paths, they're kind of, they're old and they're kind of falling apart and I'd like to have a little more, not so much surface of rock, you know. I think it would add a little contemporary feel that would mix nice with the old house, just kind of that old and new sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Agreement on style also means compromise when two avid gardeners come together. Yeah, he has to put up with me wanting to put all kinds of stuff. So the, the mishmash of stuff is more from my end, and... Uh, she puts up with me with wanting more formal things throughout the yard. And he would like to move things more than I. I like to put things in the ground and let them stay there. And so. I, like to, I like to futz with them a lot, and trim and poke around. Somehow it works. Yeah, it does. <laughs> In back, they're working in new shade when a tree they planted quickly shot up and changed their sunny dynamics. Then there's quite a few buildings back. I mean, we got a garage yeah. and a little workshop, so the backyard is really broken up into to smaller spaces, which kind of is cool because it makes, um, it's like little secret gardens back there. Right behind mm -hmm. the garage, we did all tropical, so we got bananas and uh, rice paper plants, and I've got a, this really unusual silk floss tree. So that's you know, kind of strange tropical area, and then the, the main part of the backyard, just hang out area, and there's just, there's just little tiny gardens everywhere, so it's, yeah, it's, it's, it kind of makes it fun. And also, in, in a strange way, makes it feel more spacious. Like, people always comment that we have this big backyard, but it's... It's really small. Having fun in the garden with scavenges around town was a quirk they brought from their singular gardens.
though so far Mark hasn't brought out all the bowling balls that detailed his last garden. They found some of their yard art actually in the garden. The golf balls were found here. As I was digging beds, I'd find golf balls. Um, I've picked them up out of uh, other people's yards. I walk around, I see a golf ball, and now that I have a golf ball collection going, I just kind of pick it up, bring it home, throw it in the stack. Uh, the little swans or whatever, they were uh, dumpster diving. On Not garden. dumpster diving. They were, uh, it was bulky pickup. <laughs> bulky they were pickup. out. They were out on the street <laughs> in bulky pickup. We did the bed lining of uh, Topo Chico bottles, so that was just drinking a lot of Topo Chico last summer. Some friends gave us that, yeah, and yeah. we just... I think they were throwing it out. We're like, we saw it and was like, that'd make a great planter. And yeah. It, and it does. Yeah. We switch out. Sometimes it'll have herbs. Sometimes it'll have annuals. It's got a little both now. Together, they made Brianna's bottle tree. I just love it. And I tell you, people stop walking down the street and comment on that bottle tree. And just, it really brings a smile to people's faces. The neighbors are also buddies with the dogs, part of Bree and Mark's family of rescued pets, including feral cats they've saved from the street and tamed. Rescue and renewal, in all its renditions, is simply part of who they are. It's definitely a, a melding of, of two visions that came together really nice. Thanks, Mark, for sharing your garden with us. And right now we're going to be talking about one of my favorite plant families, the irises, and I'm joined by Marnie Abel, who is the Vice President of the Austin Iris Society. Welcome to Central Texas Garden. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. Well, the iris show and sale is coming up in September. This is a calendar event for a lot of gardeners here in Austin. People know that they can go to the sale and pick up cool and unusual varieties. When's it happening this year? Uh, our sale starts September 12th. It uh, is at Zilker Botanical Gardens. Mm -hmm. Uh, 2220 Barton Springs Road. Uh, it will begin at 9 o'clock and it goes until 4 o'clock. Okay. Well, this is one that, again, I'd, I really recommend people get there and get there early if they want to get some of the cool varieties of plants. Yes, they get picked over early and we even sell out sometimes. Yeah. So you want to get there early. Which I think you know, all that speaks to the popularity of the irises, especially the bearded iris here in Austin. They're a great plant for our area. Um, I always ask people when they have particular passions about plants, how they got started with irises. How did you get started with the irises? Well, uh, we moved here in 2000 mm -hmm. and uh, I joined the Newcomers Club. And one of the activities was to go to Zilker Botanical Gardens mm -hmm. for a, a, a program. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a lady there talking about irises. Mm -hmm. She It was in April and she had brought some blooms from her garden. Mm -hmm. And I thought, those are the most beautiful flowers <laughs> I've ever seen. I've got to learn how to grow them. Yeah. So I joined the, the Iris Society, and, mm. uh, and here I am. <laughs> the rest is history, yes, is to say. Yes, yeah. Well, they are showy. Uh, they're big, showy flowers, uh, an amazing variety of color. And yes. we're going to be talking about both bearded and uh, uh, the Louisiana irises, yes. which are a personal favorite of mine. Uh, let's start off by talking about the Louis, uh, the excuse me, the Iris Society, though, just a little bit. Now, mm -hmm. uh, this is the secret brotherhood of the Iris. Now, what happens? <laughs> what happens it, at the meetings? We call ourselves Irisarians. Irisarians. <laughs> what okay. we do is have a good time learning about irises. Right. Um, we uh, we get together at the botanical center and mm. we have a potluck supper mm -hmm. and then we have programs that are designed to increase our interest and appreciation of these beautiful flowers. All right. Well, you know, and, and one of the coolest things to me about gardening in this area is there's so many other enthusiasts, you, you, you know, and you, you can learn so much from your neighbors and your friends who attend these kinds of meetings. This is where the real expertise, I think, of the gardening community is in these garden clubs like yes. the Irish Society. Mm -hmm. So if you want to learn, you can go to the meetings, and I assume you have monthly meetings. Yes, we meet the second Tuesday, mm -hmm. uh, September through May. All right. Uh, we don't meet in December, but uh, a lot of things don't meet in December. Good oh, months yeah. to take off. <laughs> <laughs> good months to take off. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, why are our iris so good for Central Texas? I mean, these are plants you see in the in the cemeteries, blooming their hearts out. You know, yeah. they haven't been cared for in years. Yeah. Well, they're very adaptable. Um, they've been around a long time. Mm. They were uh, dated back to the e ancient Egypt. Yeah. One of the uh, first garden flowers, I assume. Yeah, the pharaohs decorated their uh, uh, 
burial tombs with irises. Wow. So if they've been around that long, I, I think that they're pretty hardy. <laughs> and, and you uh, think if they survive the, in Egypt, they're pretty hardy. <laughs> <laughs> in Egypt, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Irises are a xeric plant mm -hmm. uh, uh, in these days of sustainable gardening, and we're mm -hmm. trying to uh, reduce the amount of water we use. Absolutely. The tall bearded irises are a good plant to choose for that. Um, you give them some good deep soil to grow in, mm -hmm. and uh, they will they will just perform for you. All right. Now, where in the garden can people uh, plan to pl uh, put these plants? You know, I, in my garden, I like just to tuck them into the walkways and things like that. You know, they, they, don't, they don't seem to be too fussy about the soil. They're not. They have to have some fairly deep soil to grow in. Uh, they don't do real well in shallow like soil. Like caliche or something caliche. like no, that. They no, they like not gonna loamy do well there. soil. Okay. Um, uh, but you can uh, you can put them in raised beds. You can grow them in pots. Mm -hmm. They do great uh, on the deck or mm -hmm. uh, back porch in pots. The gr so deep soil's a good tip. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming full sun is the they preference. like they like a well drained area in a sunny location. Mm -hmm. um, they can do all right in some uh, filtered light, but mm -hmm. they have to have about a half a day's sun. It's bloom um, well, yeah. Yeah, they don't like deep shade. Mm -hmm. They won't. They won't do real well for yeah. you. You know, one thing that we often hear, and I, I, I don't. I can't tell you how many times I've heard this on my radio show. I'll get a <laughs> phone call from somebody, who, uh, and they'll say, "You know, my irises stopped blooming. Why did my iris stop blooming?" That's well, a common thing, isn't it? Yeah, it can be. It can be several reasons. Um, if they're in the shade, is mm -hmm. one reason. Sometimes, if you plant an iris rhizome, uh, the first year it won't bloom. Mm -hmm. uh, it needs a little time to get acclimated and established. Right. So don't give up if it doesn't bloom the first year. Right. Um, if they're too crowded, if they get uh, root bound and too crowded, they won't perform well. The, and that's usually the, what I want to start asking questions. It usually seems to be the thing that uh, you know people say, "Oh yeah, I have lots of them. They're all crowded <laughs> around each other." Yeah. And, and yeah. They need the to diagnosis. be divided every two or three years. Right. Uh, and then, uh, but and, and they. Uh, they multiply. They mm -hmm. they need a lot of space to, yeah. to grow. They so. kind of it's a good pass along plant, isn't it? Yes, irises are passed down from generation to generation. Um, mm -hmm. If you plant one iro iris rhizome this year, mm -hmm. uh, you'll have a good chance of having five or six of them next year mm -hmm. that you can dig up and share with your family and friends. Right. And uh, we have a, we, I'm going to let the folks know we have kind of an iris theme show today because later in the program they're going to learn how to divide the irises from Tricia. So okay. that's going to be, okay. we can save that for Tricia, but okay. uh, it's a really, it is one of the wonderful things about the iris. is I, it, And it's really easy to do as well. So dividing, dividing. them, passing them along, mm -hmm. always a good thing. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about the basic care of them. You say they're xeric, which means they don't need a, a whole lot of water. Right. But they do like an occasional shot of fertilizer in the spring, I think, before they bloom. Uh, yes. Uh, the tall bearded irises, uh, if you plant them in the fall and mm -hmm. add a little bone meal, mm -hmm. and then uh, again feed them in February. We mm -hmm. like to pl feed them in uh, Valentine's Day. Right. Good way to remember it. Mm -hmm. Give them a little like bit the roses, of uh, yeah. superphosphate, and that uh, mm -hmm. stimulates the bloom and makes it makes a prettier bloom. Yeah. Uh, and then after they bloom, Cut the bloom stalks and then give them another light feeding of bone meal. Mm -hmm. Or you can use um, a formula of 6 10 10. Mm -hmm. uh, tall bearded irises don't like high nitrogen food. Mm -hmm. uh, nitrogen will uh, promote rot, mm. so you don't want to put nitrogen. Okay, so no 21 0 0. Nitrogen <laughs> is the first number in the, the formulation, right. so if it's high, don't use it. Okay, very good. <laughs> And let's talk a little bit about varieties. Now, we don't need to go into the particulars because I think there are probably mm, 20,000 different name varieties out there, <laughs> but they're, they're a stunning array of different kinds of oh, uh, bearded right. iris. Uh, you know, there are solid color forms. And t talk about some of the variation that you get. Oh, <laughs> well, they're, they come in all all forms of color mm -hmm. combinations. Um, 
There are the, uh, I don't know, the ones that have the, the colored edges. The yeah, ones the that little are, Picati, where they the call them Picati pic edges, where you picata. just get a little hint of, uh, uh -huh. of the color uh -huh. along the edge. Uh -huh. Sometimes you get the, the what they call the standards, or the, the petals that come up are one color, and, and then the falls are... Yeah, those are bitones. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You have to come to our meeting to learn all these all these terms. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but there, but it, it really is just uh -huh. a stunning variety, and oh, the range yes. of colors is... It, it, uh, almost from white to black yes, uh, and yes. everything in between and uh, stunning deep purple colors and uh, solid golds and uh, you know in my garden I have one this year called Persian berry that I, I had oh that's an old standard yes and we, let me tell are. you that my it is uh, it was a real eye catcher for a lot of the guests in my garden they it's love a, that plant. a real pinky mauvey beautiful beautiful yeah. great colors. great yeah. stuff and yeah. you'll, we, also the Louisianas, uh, we haven't had much chance to visit about those, but this is a plant that is likes kind of the mucky conditions in the yes. garden. Yes, Louisianas like to live where it's wet and soggy. Mm -hmm. They'll grow by uh, streams and ponds mm -hmm. and in the in the. Uh, the where, Louisiana swamps. Yeah. That's where most of the new, the old cultivars came from, was right. the Louisiana swamps. So if folks have yeah. a wet spot in their if yard. If they have a wet spot, that's a great place to grow yeah. uh, Louisianas. Okay. They also do great in pots, too. Yeah. I, yeah. I have a special place in my heart for Louisianas and the bearded iris. And I really, again, want to encourage folks to get out to the show. It's going to be on September 5th. Is that right? No, 12th. 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 September 12th. Okay. Yeah. Nine, nine to four. Nine to four. At the Zilker Botanical Auditorium. Okay. Yeah. And uh, there's a telephone number if you need uh, more information or we'll, directions. We'll, we'll have that on the website. Thank you okay. so much, Marnie, for coming Thank on. You. And I uh, hope, again, you get lots of visitors. And I hope we have encouraged people to grow irises. Okay, great. <laughs> coming up next is Skip. Hello, and welcome to Down to Earth. This has been one of the biggest droughts on record, and many of you who enjoy gardening are getting kind of desperate right now with the heat of summer finally breaking and it's time for fall gardening. But it's still hot outside, and if you want to go out and plant a garden, a common question is how do you successfully get seeds started in this kind of heat? Well, you want to keep the seed bed moist. As you work up the soil and get it ready for planting seed, you want to plant them at the proper depth, moisten the soil, and if you can do so gradually with a fine mist, it helps prevent crusting, which makes it a little more difficult for the seeds to push the soil up. If you can put some type of a shade over the seed row, that really helps too. You can suspend a little shade cloth or even some row cover fabric over the row, and that takes a little bit of the intensity of the sun out, helps the soil stay moist a little longer and helps the seeds get off to a good start. Once the seed starts to germinate, if it dries out, it'll kill it. So you want to make sure and keep them watered. That may take a couple of waterings a day during the hot, dry, and windy weather to get those seeds up and going. Another technique is to stick shrub branches in the ground at an angle to kind of shade the sun. You can prune some branches off of an evergreen or a, perhaps if you have a bamboo some, somewhere, uh, stick those in the ground. Some people even use license plates to shade young plants as they're getting started just to kind of get them used to that really rough environment. One final suggestion you might consider is starting your seed in the shade. Go to a nearby tree and in an area where you can set up some transplant trays out in the outer shade where it's really bright but out of the direct sun, start your seeds there and then when they're up and growing, transplant them into the garden. That way they'll have a much better, easier time of getting started. I like to start lettuce and spinach and other things that way because by the time it cools off enough for them to want to germinate in the garden, I'd really like to already be growing those crops in the garden. This week's featured plant is flowering senna. Flowering senna is a beautiful plant in the late summer and fall when it bursts with blooms. It forms a small tree, depending on the growing conditions, about five to 10 feet high, and has beautiful yellow blooms that come all over the tree. It's quite hardy in our area. Sometimes in, in colder climates, it can die down to the ground, but we find that here it does really well coming back for us each year. And it is a late season bloomer, so it gives you some late season color in the garden. You can let it form a giant mounded bush, or you can and trim it up, forming sort of a mini tree by removing the branches down around the lower trunk.
Out in the garden, it's time to plant the last planting of those warm season crops like green beans and cucumbers or squash. When the first frost hits, it'll shut them down. So if you don't get them out really soon, they won't have time to grow, set fruit, and you get a good harvest before the first frost. We never know when that's gonna occur. Usually it's sometime in November, but it could even be late October or December in our erratic weather here in this climate. If you've got any fruit trees or fruit plants in the landscape, continue to water them. They've been setting their fruit buds for next year and you don't want them to stress now. They need to go into winter fairly strong. That doesn't require a lot of water, but just a little bit to keep the tree healthy if it's still dry in the climate. Chinch bugs are still attacking lawns and need to be controlled because they'll downright kill a St. Augustine lawn especially. So check for those. If you see some dead areas around the landscape where perhaps uh, the grass adjoins a sidewalk or driveway, that may be chinch bugs. Also, it's time you can still plant marigolds. And if you want to take any cuttings for rooting indoors, now's a good time to do that. Now this will be my last taping because I've changed jobs, moving to our county extension director job out of the horticulture job. But it's good news. We've hired a horticulturist for the AgriLife Extension office here, Daphne Richards, and you'll enjoy watching her, I'm sure. For more plant tips or to contact the office in your area, visit klru.org ctg. Thanks, Skip. Now let's check in with Trisha Shirey for Backyard Basics. One of the greatest flowers for any xeriscape garden is the, the um, iris. They're also known as flags. The bearded iris have been around for many, many years and have been uh, shared among friends and uh, sold everywhere for many, many years. And they love our alkaline soils, so they're quite happy in a xeric garden in, in alkaline soils. They don't, they're not particularly fussy about soil. Deer do sometimes eat the blooms, typically won't eat the foliage, so it's something that you can grow in the hill country. And they come in almost every color, from yellows to oranges to reds to blues and purples. They really can give you quite a color show. Some of them are quite small and others are larger, and they do make a wonderful cut flower, and many of them have wonderful fragrances as well, so there's really a lot to recommend with iris. They do, however, need to be pruned and divided every couple of years because if you let them grow into very large uh, crowded clumps, they just won't bloom as well. So uh, every couple of years you'll want to do that. And with most perennials, you'll want to divide and do your uh, uh, work with them in the season opposite their bloom. So since they bloom in the spring, we do that in early fall. And that gives them a chance to adjust and grow and put on new roots and set blooms again for the following spring. Plus it's easier on the gardener. It's a little bit cooler, we hope. So you'll want to take a spading fork and go around the clump very gently and just lift them and loosen them and then once you get those clumps out set them aside prepare the soil well now they don't need a very rich soil so a little compost is great a little of a balanced organic fertilizer but they just don't need the same soil uh, fertility as say daylilies to get going and do well so you'll end up with rhizomes that look like this and the rhizome that has bloomed the previous spring is not going to bloom again and you'll know those because they're the ones that look kind of old and leathery. They may be uh, kind of corky looking. Uh, and those you'll just cut away and discard. You can put those in the compost pile. Do look for iris rhizomes that are kind of soft because that may indicate a, a bacterial disease. And if they have holes in them that look like borer holes, you'll definitely want to discard those, uh, not in the compost, in the trash. But just cut off uh, any of the, the uh, new uh, shoots of the, the rhizomes and those will be the ones that you plant again. So just take a sharp pair of shears and cut uh, those away and again discard this old part and if you have any roots that are torn or ragged or shriveled you'll want to cut those away. Now you do want to keep these moist until you get a chance to get them in the soil so do 
cover these up with a, a wet sheet, put them in the shade as you're preparing them. Uh, they can stay out of the soil for a while, but it's best not to let them dry out completely because it's very difficult to get them rehydrated again. If, if your roots do dry out, just soak them in a uh, water solution, just the barely cover the rhizome with water and let those roots plump up again before you're going to uh, water them. If you need to store them or if you're shipping to them to someone, you can wrap them in wet excelsior or moss and keep them uh, damp that way. So when you cut these uh, ends of the rhizomes, one of the things that's great to do is just take a little dusting sulfur and dab that cut end in the dusting sulfur and that can help cut down on fungal problems and, and bacterial problems in the rhizomes and uh, keep them nice and uh, healthy. So you'll cut away the foliage. Some of this foliage looks a little brown and discolored. So take some very sharp scissors and I like to cut them in a chevron so that the uh, upper leaves are more pointed. And then you wanna plant them not terribly deeply. I think that's one of the main reasons people have problems with their irises. They try to plant them too deeply. You really want the surface of the, the rhizome to be right at the surface of the soil. So you'll want to make a little hill and press those roots into the side and you'll pull the soil up and really compact it around the soil. And I like to line the rhizomes up in the same direction but plant them in little triangles of the same color. And you can see here that rhizome is, is really showing at the surface of the soil. And I don't mulch the iris, they just don't need a lot of mulch. But if you plant them properly, divide them occasionally, share them with your friends, you will have displays of uh, color that are just really show-stopping. Visit klru.org slash ctg for more tips, online video, and our weekly blog. Next week, we get ready for fall vegetables. Until then, I'll see you in the garden. Visit klru.org slash ctg to learn more about today's program upcoming events, and to sign up for our electronic newsletter. Check out John's how-to tips and visit Trisha's Corner for ideas inside and out. Get growing at klru.org slash ctg. Support for Central Texas Gardener comes from HEB Texas Backyard, helping to beautify your backyard. From patio sets to Texas tough landscape plants, let HEB Texas Backyards help you get your garden started today.